Okay, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, and for roll call, I've got everybody except for Bryden and Susie at this point, and including Kim, Eric, Eileen, Angela, Joanne, and Justin. Um, no public today. So the first thing is if we could look at the minutes from February. And if I could entertain a motion to approve these. I move to approve the minutes from February. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Second. A second. Oh, sorry. Is that you, Rhea? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes as presented, please say, uh, wave your hand. <laughs> Since we don't have our eye thing going. And opposed. Okay, so the minutes are approved in a unanimous fashion. Great. Okay, um, Eric, if you would like to share your screen with us, then um, we will look at the proposed accessions. Hey, Bryden. Hello. So we have three accessions um, this month. Um, first one is from the Longmont High class of 1917. Um, includes a yearbook, um, a scrapbook, clippings, photos, and as well as some items from their 50th reunion in uh, 1967. Um, one interesting thing about the yearbook is that the face of one boy has been removed and cut out on two different pages. We don't know why, but uh, it was the donor's grandmother that, that donated, that uh, had been in the class of 1917. It was not someone she uh, would ultimately be married to or anything, so we don't know if it was an ex-boyfriend or what the story was. Um, that is our first accession. Any questions on that one? And I can't see everyone, so just go ahead and, and speak up if you do have a have a question. All right, we will move on to the next one. Um, so this relates to our ongoing uh, COVID uh, collecting initiative. Uh, these are items that were given out during the 2020 Boulder County elections. So we have a mask, uh, a face shield, and then a uh, poll book uh, training uh, book. Um, so this is significant both for, for uh, reflecting the COVID situation as well as the 2020 elections. Um, so any questions on that? Hearing none, we will move to um, the last accession, which is uh, uh, a crate of 24 glass bottles and the crate itself from the Red Rock Bottling Company. Um, the bottles are Rocket Beverage. Um, and they do actually say, it's a little hard to read, but the um, crate does actually say Longmont, Colorado, and the bottles also say bottled in Longmont, Colorado. So um, definitely a uh, um, local company. There were apparently Red Rock bottling companies in other communities as well, um, but uh, this particular one uh, documented well in Longmont. Any questions on this or really any of our, our accessions? Uh, we'll go ahead and pause here uh, before we talk about the last slide. So uh, we can move to uh, accept or have any further discussion on the accessions. I have a question, Eric. Okay. So um, if we ex ex um, 
taking these bottles, you indicated that there we have one in our collection already. Would it be um, something that then would be considered that individual bottle be considered for de accession perhaps? Or it's it's possible. Um, honestly, we we usually look for bigger or, or things in in you know poor condition for deaccession right now. So, but yeah, at some point, if we're, you know, looking around for other things to deaccession, that would, that would certainly be an option since we've got a, a much more complete collection than that single bottle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was kind of my question on the, the fifth slide too, was if we have, you know, something similar, but it isn't as complete, you know, does it put itself out there as a possibility for deaccession? Yeah, so I think we'll we'll open that up for discussion once we've had the the vote on That's on fine. these. Yeah, so. That's fine. Is there a motion to um, approve these all of these accessions? Dale, is there a second? Sorry, I can't see everybody. A second. Chris, thank you. Um, all in favor of. Um, accessioning all of these items, please. Um, can't see everybody, but wave your hands. <laughs> Great. Um, all opposed? Chair, I can see that that is a, that all did put their hands up. Oh, thanks very much, Angela. Um, so the um, accession of these items is unanimously approved. So thank you very much. All right, so then we'll move to the donation for review. Um, so this is actually something that we have not yet received. Uh, the uh, potential donor actually got bit by a dog and so had to postpone it, but I thought it was a good opportunity because this is a case where we have, again, very similar items. In this case, it is a one-to-one, -one. one bottle. We have one bottle almost identical in the collection. Um, so, um, wanted to bring it to the board. Um, as, as Eve raised, it's always possible for the museum to deaccession uh, an existing bottle, but it's not a quick process. We have to do a lot of documentation. Um, we bring it back to the board. It requires a higher, a two thirds majority of, of the board uh, to approve. Um, so it's not as simple as just, oh, we've got a better one, we'll get rid of the old one. Um, so it's one of the reasons why I wanted to kind of bring it to the board and just sort of see your general thoughts on these situations where we might get something that's in a little better condition or um, just um, a little different example, but very, very similar to one we've had. I think it's cool that it has a lid. You know, that's the kind of stuff that's always lost or often. So I think it's, that's, that's very cool. Other thoughts from anyone? In looking, this is Tom, in looking at the two bottles, is there a clarity of one better than the other? Um, it's a little hard to tell. We just have the photo of the one, so I can't compare them side by side. Um, the one that we have was taken against a blue background, so it it may appear more clear um, than it actually is because because the background is actually a, a pretty uh, a darker blue than it appears in the photo. Um, so I would tend to say that that they're probably pretty similar um, in in sort of glass clarity. Ours is definitely still still dirty. Uh, you can see the dirt down inside of there, which obviously we could wash out if, if we ever exhibited it. Unless it's special dirt. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> How old is the dirt? <laughs> That's right. Dale, did you have a comment? You need to get off a of mute first. You're on mute. Mm. 
There you go. Sorry. Um, I had a question. I've heard, a lot, you know, on and off about the Lamont Bottling Works or whatever they were called. What, Eric, do you know, did they bottle a variety of things or were they all, I mean, for instance, these bottles look fairly small to me. I mean, I would guess they're what, five inches, six inches high, maybe. Yeah, that's probably about right. Yeah. Um, did they bottle different, did they have different kinds of bottles? Did they bottle a lot of different substances or? Every bottle, I mean, all the 12 that we have are almost exactly the same size. They have different markings on them, um, but they're all pretty much that same um, volume. We know they did bottle a lot of different substances because we have a photo of the interior of the bottling works and there are things like pine apple soda and pine and apple are two different words. So I don't know if it's pineapple soda or pine <laughs> apple soda. Um, there's also birch beer and a couple of other flavors of soda. Um, so they, they bottled a number of things, but every bottle we've ever uh, acquired is, is this size. And, and they all say Longmont Bottling Works or what, whatever. So this, this particular, these two say uh, City Bottling Works, Longmont, Colorado. Some of the other ones say just Longmont Bottling Works or... But they don't, they don't actually have any identification of what's in the bottle? Nope. No, I don't know if originally there was a paper label that's gone or if you were just surprised when you took a drink. Um. Well, I don't, I think we should pursue getting the bottle that has the lid personally. I don't know. I don't know if that's really something for us to vote on, but are there other thoughts? Oh, I feel the same way. I, you know, it's like a cup without a handle or something if you don't have the stopper. Yeah, Wonder I, oh. Go ahead. I was just to say, I agree. I mean, philosophically, it makes sense in that if we're going to be trying to have things like this, we should have the best ones. So I wonder if the lids. stopper's got lead in it. Hmm. Sorry. I don't know. Just wondering how, I can't, it's hard to tell what the stopper really looks, you know, how it would have worked. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure until I actually see it. Um, but, um, all right, great. So hopefully if, if the donor um, is able to come in uh, next month, you'll see this as a regular uh, accession uh, to the collection. So I am going to stop sharing. Thanks, Eric. Okay. Um, Kim, would you like to give us your report? I would be delighted. Oh, good. <laughs> me, did we have to vote on that? Did Eve, did oh, we have I, to vote on that last bottle? I just wasn't sure. I don't think so. Um, somebody okay. correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was more of just a uh, looking for interest. So yeah, okay. Here. Since we don't actually have it in our possession yet, um, I'd prefer to wait until we physically got it in hand, just so if something happens, a uh, person ends up not donating, we, we don't have sure. it on the record. It was just a technical question, I was wondering. Thanks, Tom, that's good. We don't wanna, don't wanna miss stuff. Susie, hello, welcome. Um, so, Kim, you're up. All right, I'm up. Um, I am going to go, you guys got a copy of the director's report, so I'm going to go through it quickly. And um, as usual, if you have any questions, please just stop me along the way. Um, we have contracted with a new architect to help us complete our master development plan. Um, we've met with them 
uh, as a group um, in um, once, and then they did a site visit today at the museum, um, and they have on their schedule to be complete with the master development plan um, in early June. So we're looking forward to having that document. And there will be, um, for this architect that we're working with, there will be some opportunities to provide feedback um, for all of you. Um, and so they'll they'll plan some um, sort of public outreach events for that process as well. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, we also have our fund development manager was um, approved recently. And so that position opened. Um, as a reminder, that's a position that's funded by our SCFD dollars. Um, so those are going to be ongoing dollars. So um, we were able to get that position approved. Um, it closed on March the 5th. And so um, we've selected seven candidates that we're going to be interviewing um, starting on Friday. So that process is moving forward. And I hope to have somebody on board sort of ASAP. Um, we also completed, um, as you know, the community and audience engagement assessment. Um, and in, in that process that we did with our peer reviewers, um, one of the things that came to the, um, kind of rose to the top was to do an interpretive plan. Um, and, and this was many, many meetings ago. So I, I will remind you and, and maybe um, inform some of you that we got a donation from the Stewart Family Foundation of $60,000. I believe it was in late 2019. And so um, you all approved us having part of that money pay for uh, the interpretive plan. And so part of the money is paying for the master development plan and then part of the money is paying for our interpretive plan. And so I am working with the woman that we received um, a proposal from and we're trying to figure out best timing for that given all the other things that are going on at the museum. So we'll be engaging in that um, as soon as we can. I thought I heard a question. So just stop me and yell at me if, if you do. Um, We've got a lot of marketing going on for our um, exhibit that's up right now, the Enduring Impressionism, uh, Enduring Impressions Exhibition. Um, we are also seeking sponsors for Longmont 150. Um, that one opens on August the 7th. Um, and so if you have any great ideas for a sponsorship um, for that exhibition, please let us know. That would be great. Um, the museum also raised uh, $25,000 from 150 individuals as part of our year and annual giving. And that really was aimed, um, the pitch really was about um, COVID recovery. And so we had a lot of very generous, this is more money than we've ever raised for our annual campaign. And it was clear that people were being very, very generous to us um, in, in the wake of the um, pandemic. So that was, that was very um, nice to see. Our summer camps um, opened on March the 9th, and so we're getting uh, a lot of registrations for that. We have um, basically kind of got three prongs of summer camps that we're offering in person, socially distanced. We're doing some outdoors, and then we're doing some virtually so that everybody kind of has an opportunity to engage at their own comfort level. Um, and we're hopeful that that's going to be a, a good combination for people to be able to find some opportunities for their kiddos for the summer. Um, we've also got some uh, Discovery Days kits that are going out in the final month. And as I've mentioned to you before, that has been a very, very successful program during the pandemic that um, basically uh, uh, parents are picking up these kits for their kiddos and being able to do those sort of um, as, as they want to, but they can also get onto the uh, sort of um, moderated uh, vi virtual with um, Miss Lee, so it's been it's been very very successful. So we're we're pleased with the turnout for those. The art and sip programs are also going well, um, and we've been able to. <laughs> we actually got a big compliment um, during the city manager's meeting. He does a, a weekly meeting, and someone actually sent him an email to say that they were really enjoying the art and sip program. So that was nice to hear through our city manager. Um, let's see, we've got members registrations. I, I mentioned the summer camp. So member registration opened um, last week and then the registration for the general public is this week. So we, we should see those um, uh, enrollments bump up pretty quickly. And then as far as the collections um, go, Eric helped kick off the celebration for Longmont 150. 
Um, and it was very, very cool. I hope that you guys had an opportunity to um, log on for that uh, virtual program. And if you haven't had a chance to see it, I, I would highly recommend going back to find it because it was a very heartwarming program, that birthday celebration. So you can log on to um, our website and find the Facebook page for that. It's very, very cool. Um, and so he opened the time capsule from 1996 as part of that um, program. Um, and then there were a lot of other festivities, including uh, the symphony um, doing a rendition of Happy Birthday. So it was really fun. Eileen's been working with our digital communication specialist, Scott Yoho, uh, to work on the next tour for our mobile app. And this one focuses on Latino history in Longmont. So they had um, some uh, consultants helping them with that project. And um, so we'll be rolling that out soon. Scott's been a really great asset to the museum. He was um, a person that we were able to hire with our NEH grant. Um, to help with digital um, and virtual programming. So we've been really, really lucky to have him. We've, he's been a real asset to us. We've also been able to have um, volunteers back into archives. So, um, you know, changes on the dial have allowed that to happen. Um, and so we're able to do some cataloging that have been has been kind of backing up. So all the things that you guys have been approving, they have been gone uncatalogued. So we've been able to have some volunteers in, in the archives to help with that now. So that's really great. And then in exhibitions, we continue to um, develop and design Longmont 150. Um, included in your report is a photograph of a, a low rider that um, the shop is designing and building with the assistance of our CU intern Ainsley. Um, and so you can kind of get a glimpse of what they are able to build with um, the shop bot and with the tools that they have in the workshop, which I think are, is always very impressive. Um, and then Brack is researching and designing um, a model railroad layout that's going to be part of the exhibition. Um, and then Eric is helping with the, the layout and the design of the exhibition as well. Um, we've also got a section of the exhibition that's going to be looking at racial equity. And so Eric's been working a lot with um, a, a committee that is helping develop the whole exhibit. But this has been a particularly poignant aspect of it since there's just not a lot to collect for that. Um, and so they're, they've been very helpful in, in trying to help um, tell the story about racial equity in Longmont. Um, but if you've got any suggestions about objects, again, let us know because that would that would be a great addition to the exhibition. Um, we are going, um, we're, do, we're also doing five different satellite cases that are going to be around different city buildings that are going to also include um, uh, aspects of the, the anniversary. And so you can see those at the Senior Center, the Rec Center, Library, Civic Center, and Safety and Justice Building. Um, then we've also got um, Eric Zimmer's pieces are in the atrium and we're going to keep those there. Those, those tiny little paintings, if you've seen them on the way back wall in the atrium. So those are going to stay up, um, I think, until September. They've been very good sellers, so it's been good to have them. Um, and then we continue to work with the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art on an exhibition that will pair artists with farmers to do some installations. And so there'll be an installation piece in um, at, in Boulder and then at, in Longmont, and then ho hopefully some slight sites along uh, in farms between our two institutions. So we're looking forward to developing that exhibition even further. Um, and then we'll be doing some internships um, starting in the fall. And we we had some money um, in the budget that were that was earmarked for um, uh, installation help, um, hired hands for installation help for Longmont 150. And what we were able to do is have the city manager actually approve that money to be used for interns, which is going to be super helpful because um, the there's a particular program um, that CU has that is. Oh, I've forgot, totally forgotten the name of it. I went, oh yeah, environmental design. Um, and they have, the students in that program are just really, really well-trained. And so they're kind of perfect for, to help Jared with the work that he does in exhibits. And so we'll be able to pay them, which is also going to be a really big deal because of course you attract better candidates and it's much more equitable if you're able to do that. So we're, we're pleased to, to be able to get to that place that we can pay them. 
Um, and then, of course, we continue to get requests for fabricating plexiglass barriers in various departments through the city. And so Jared continues to do that for um, uh, coronavirus um, prevention. There's a big section here about the auditorium that I'm actually going to reserve for Justin so he can kind of talk about some of those things. Um, and then we've got uh, a couple of sections here for visitor services. So our exhibition Enduring Impressions has brought in almost $7,000 in revenue for the first six weeks of the exhibit and Saturdays are, are selling out. As you guys, I think know we've got time tickets for that exhibition. And so we're basically selling out all the time tickets for Saturdays and we're coming close on Fridays. So we're doing pretty well for the exhibit attendance. Um, let's see, we've had 1,270 people view the exhibit since it opened, uh, and it, this is as of the date of this report, so that's probably about a week ago now. Um, we've got, again, this Discovery Days kits are being um, picked up at curbside, so the front desk is helping a lot with that and getting it out the door. And then we've got gift shop, shop sales um, for the Impressionism exhibit that are really doing quite well as well. Um, the attendance so far for, oh no, I'm sorry, the attendance for 2020, which is interesting in my mind, is was actually really good. So our typical in-person attendance is about 60, 65,000 annually. And given all the virtual programming that we did, um, the total attendance was 126,000 people. And so that's that's pretty amazing. And we hope to keep that, that kind of momentum up. There were 111,420 people um, doing the virtual programs and then about 15,000 um, in-person people. So um, so we will, I think it's it's a given that that uh, virtual programming has really reached a lot of folks. And so even, even once we get to a place where we can seriously meet in person, I think we will continue to do some virtual programs. Um, and then we also, of course, have um, the auditorium outfitted with um, cameras and new equipment that were funded through the city manager's office with their um, uh, CARES dollars. So, um, so now we've got great equipment for it, too. And then in art and public places, um, there's some projects going on over at the Civic Center to try to uh, uh, kind of coordinate with, um, you know, the, the development that's been happening there, the uh, construction that's been happening over there. Um, and so hoping to get some art and public places um, installations happening with that. Um, AIPP and the um, LDDA um, slash the creative district met with the creative lab to discuss a um, trying to get a creative cultural plan off the ground. So this is something that we've been talking about at the museum for quite some time, um, trying to really um, integrate just some planning and some strategic partnerships that for the whole of Longmont to be able to try to understand kind of what um, creatives need, what people in the city are willing to pay for, what the people in the city are willing to attend and, and um, support. Um, and so this is an effort now that includes art and public places, the museum, um, the creative district, LDDA, um, and then I think the city manager's office got a little bit of money for it as well. So we're really hoping to um, the, get the wheels cranking on a creative uh, cultural plan that'll probably get kicked off in the next probably three or four months. Um, and then we've got shock art calls that are out, um, the call for entry voting strategy and the digital and in-person marketing um, in museum newsletter and social media and in local newspapers. So that's it for my director's report. Anybody got any questions? All righty, thank you. Always, you're welcome to contact me if you do. Great, thanks, Kim. Um, I don't have a report today, but as we talked about, I think maybe last time, we, we are going to have various staff um, doing presentations for us so that we have a better idea of the things that they're doing at the museum. So today we have Justin Veach, who's the auditorium and events manager for the museum. And I don't know if I have your title right, Justin, but um, okay. Um, anyway, so he's gonna spend, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes and tell us a little bit more about what he does and what's happening at the auditorium. And then we'll have some time for questions after. Hello, I am coming at you live and direct from the museum's marvelous Stewart Auditorium this evening. It's great to see you all. Thank you all 
for having me and uh, thank you for all that you do for the museum. Um, we're really glad to have your support out there in the community. Um, and I haven't met a lot of you, so this is a first time, first time meetup for me, for a bunch of you. Um, I've been here for going on uh, three years, uh, next month, actually. Um, it kind of went fast and slow at the same time, like really fast and also, also seems kind of like eons this last year, especially. Um, I have a background in um, nonprofit, uh, kind of an extensive background in nonprofit arts and cultural institutions. Um, I'm really a, a contemporary art guy, contemporary art, theater, dance, and performance uh, with a solid foundation in, in uh, literary arts programming as well. So author events and that kind of thing. I did my undergrad at Naropa back in the 90s and sort of cut my nonprofit arts teeth at BMOCA. I worked for the uh, BMOCA's theater uh, back when they had an 87 seat theater there. I worked with Judy Hussey Taylor who went on to run, uh, who's the director of uh, Dance Space Project in um, New York, which is a big deal dance organization. I did my master's degree at uh, California Institute of the Arts in Valencia, California, and I'm an Angelino and a diehard Laker fan, third generation Angelino. So I'm just another displaced Californian out here. Um, I'm really excited about this space. This is a really beautiful, gorgeous little space. And um, this is actually, I think, maybe the fourth venue that I've been associated with or worked for or worked with um, of this size. And I really enjoy this size. It allows for a lot of, um, it's like a little race car or sports car or something. You can, it's a lot more maneuverable uh, than like a big, giant, bulky uh, behemoth of a performing arts center or something. Uh, you can get away, you can have, uh, you know, 35 people in here and it feels, pretty good, uh, which is great. Um, when I first started here, I really wanted to focus on um, kind of diversifying our programming and to really reflect um, the uh, multidisciplinary nature of the museum. Um, that, so that meant really uh, trying to increase the flexibility of this space because um, it's mainly uh, built as a uh, recital hall. Uh, you know, Lila Stewart was a big fan of classical music, thus our gorgeous Shigeru Kawai piano that she donated for us in addition to this space. Um, so it's not, it's, it's, you know, for theater, it's not ideal. Um, for amplified music, it's not ideal. So I, I added curtains, which has helped. Um, and we continue to work on ways to kind of uh, improve flexibility so that we can support a, a myriad and a real variety of uh, performing arts activities uh, beyond just classical acoustic music. So, you know, we've done some stuff with, um, well, we had Buntport Theater up for a, for a weekend uh, from Denver. They're a really great uh, kind of um, contemporary uh, theater company down in Denver, they're really uh, kind of kooky and a little experimental and very smart. Um, uh, we've, we've, you know, we've had all of the, uh, the local folks um, in, you know, including the Centennial State Ballet and uh, Seicento Baroque Ensemble and other uh, performing arts groups. Um, one of the things I really, uh, one of the things that I rolled out was, um, something called Museum Presents, uh, which, is, um, which is this kind of programming. Um, so instead we have our Thursday nights and then we have um, more elaborate or more, more uh, expensive, bigger ticket performances that happen over the course of a weekend. And hopefully uh, these will happen over the course of perhaps several weekends um, at some point. Um, but these these are these are bigger scale productions, um, and really focusing on on a variety and a diversity of of programming. Um, in the first two years that I was here, um, pre COVID, uh, we saw a lot of. Uh, um, we, said, we saw a serious increase in ticket sales, which was exciting. Um, 2019 was kind of a, 
um, was was a record year in terms of ticket sales. And then 2020, we were real. Uh, 2020, we were really off, going off. On, we were off to the races, uh, and then March happened. Um, but we've been increasing the number of uh, number of events, uh, number of programs, um, and that's that's been going pretty well. Um, when COVID hit, of course, uh, we had to completely change direction. Um, the show had to go on line. The show, the show must go on line. So um, we just switched to an online format and started blasting things out to Facebook Live. That, that started off with me in my uh, den at home uh, during you know, hosting conversations with people. Um, you know, with Eric on collections. We did a number of inside uh, kind of behind the scenes uh, museum programs. Uh, we did a tour of uh, Terry Maker's uh, home and uh, studio space. Um, and then when we hit uh, summer concerts, we decided to, uh, to offer them all uh, live, uh, live online. And and have them uh, and produce them from the auditorium. So we switched from my my den, which wouldn't fit all those musicians, to the auditorium, and we were, we streamed from here. And we've basically been streaming uh, from the auditorium ever since. There are now uh, cameras. We have a camera mounted on each side of the auditorium. I feel like a stewardess or something, and a uh, one behind me in the center too, uh, all which are motorized and can be controlled remotely from our uh, tech booth um, where we have uh, monitors um, and we can, it's like a little, we're now a little TV studio practically. Uh, so we can capture all kinds of stuff um, more efficiently um, and uh, with better angles. Um, we work with uh, Longmont Public Media, who's the uh, city's um, AV contractor. They also run uh, Channel 8, Longmont Channel 8, 880. Um, and through the museum's agreement with them, their contract with them, they're able to capture all of our programming, which is really, really special. So we have uh, great video people who get to use our great equipment and we're getting a good product as a result. And, you know, one of the great things about, uh, you know, Kim mentioned this, one of the wonderful things about or the silver lining, if there is one, to not having actual people in the space uh, and live streaming is that we've, we've really expanded our audience and uh, touched many, many, many more people than we would through uh, just you know, having, having people in the audience. Um, so that's, that's exciting. So we, it makes me wonder what it will be like uh, when we do come out of this and whether, uh, whether our audiences will be even larger than they were before. Um, that's exciting. Um, I also uh, manage rentals for the museum um, and rentals have been um, not only a source of, of income for us, but um, another way to engage the community and support the community, whether it's uh, performing arts uh, like the Longmont Symphony, renting out the, the auditorium for concerts or uh, local nonprofits uh, utilizing the space for fundraisers or people, people having weddings. We've really focused on um, you know, providing excellent customer service and really supporting people's events. And, uh, and, and so much so that we, we have a stake in the success of what you do here. So we really try to bring our expertise in, in presentation to everything we do here, um, just like we do to our own pro, for our own programming. And I think, uh, I, think that's, I, th I think that's been evidenced through the, well, we've gotten lots of good feedback and our rentals have been up uh, pre-COVID. Um, Let's see, what else? Oh, coming up. So um, one of the things we did, um, you know, our Thursday night programming uh, was uh, previously uh, entitled Views and Brews, uh, which was uh, mainly film programming. Um, um, and it was oftentimes themed around like cult classics or um, some other theme. Um, and I've really worked to diversify that. So pre-COVID and then moving forward as we come out of COVID, uh, it'll be uh, less, much less film and uh, concerts. Instead, we'll be doing concerts and uh, um, talks and readings and uh, that sort of thing. Um, 
one of the great things about this auditorium is it's a vehicle for for engaging not only new audiences but for working with other organizations and artists um, you can get so many people through this space right 365 days there are 365 days a year so that's three practically 365 uh, opportunities to to bring people through this space and develop relationships with them. So we've had uh, Bobby Lefebvre, the Colorado State Poet Laureate, has done two programs with us. Um, we we've uh, we've developed a uh, uh, a uh, what, are we, what are we calling it? Cultural spotlight. What what am I calling it, Kim? Is it the cultural spot? Anyway. It's basically we spotlight a local uh, arts institution that's been doing good work um, and present it to uh, the people of Longmont. So we did that with Cleo Parker Robinson dance um, and we celebrated their 50th anniversary and Cleo came down, taught, they talked about, she, she was in conversation with one of her young choreographers and they talked about the history of the organization and, and what they do with video clips. It was really great. And then we just recently did the same thing with Sue Teatro uh, down in Denver, which is Denver's oldest uh, Latino uh, theater company. So we had their, uh, their um, executive director in conversation with Bobby Lefebvre. And so every time we, we, we have a new program, we develop new relationships and really expand, uh, we really kind of expand our tendrils out into the front range in Colorado, which is, I think, very exciting. Um, and each program leads to another program, it seems like too. Um, I've also, uh, as a result of the, of the of, of, you know, everything that happened this summer and late spring with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and that sort of thing, um, I've really, um, and through some, um, some, some, uh, a, there's a CU Boulder program I was a part of where we read read the uh, How to Be an Anti Racist book. It was a DEI study group through the CU Boulder with other arts and cultural institution leaders, and uh, I, I have felt very uh, uh, inspired and driven to really bring home uh, DEI related programming to the museum, and I know that's a, a priority for us all here. Um, um, and so we've done some programming, uh, some panels on the history of race and social justice here in Longmont. Um, we're doing a panel uh, discussion here tomorrow night on art and social justice. Um, um, so diversity has really been 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 key um, uh, in terms of all programming that I'm looking at lately. Um, so really, it's uh, you know, we we are making it through uh, COVID, and uh, we we think that we'll come out even even better than we were. You know, this was a time for kind of some some growth on our part, and uh, my my own uh, my own, the level of programming I've been doing since COVID started here um, has really increased dramatically, um, and I'm hoping that I can sustain that when rentals come back and. And, and we get back to normal. Great. Um, well, thank you, Justin. It, would yeah. you mind just wrapping up, and then we'll take some questions if people have specifics. Yeah, I, you know, I would love. I'm, I'm always interested in feedback. Um, I'm always interested in uh, ideas, suggestions, what have you. Um, so, um, I, I think I kind of ended. <laughs> I think I think I kind of reached the end. I could I could go on. No, that's what I was afraid of. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Put a cork in it, Beach. Anyway, um, feel free to shoot some questions my way. Does anybody have questions now that they'd like to ask Justin? Or okay, I just had a quick comment. Great, um, Justin. My wife and I have, and friends of ours have been logging into um, uh, Thursday night uh, programming, and um, it's just been we've been really impressed. It's been utterly great. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, the work that is going into it is uh, certainly not being unnoticed. It's not unnoticed. Thank you, Brad. I hope you tune in tomorrow. It's going to be real. It's going to be a great conversation. Really. We're planning on it. Artists. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? Thanks. Thank you very much, Justin. This is a uh... This is a, it's a nice way to start this off. And I think, you know, each meeting we have um, as we go forward, we'll get somebody else from the staff to 
give us the lowdown on what their job entails and what's what's happening. So thank you very much for being the first. Thanks for having me and have a good rest of your evening until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. You're welcome. Okay, so um, the next things we'll look at are the, our old business. And I have to tell you the land acknowledgement statement is the first thing up. And um, I know that Eric shared information with us about what's been happening, at least in museum, city, other places. And I don't know um, that at this point, we really are in a position to do a lot more. Eric, I mean, you or Kim, if you have comments about that, I don't know if it's something that we need to try to set up a subcommittee or if at this point, there's just too much going on. I'm not quite sure what the status is. As far as um, what our role in this is. Go ahead, uh, Tom. Oh, sorry. Thomas, did you have a? Yeah, I had a question. I just wondered if any other entities of the city. I, I saw Thomas's in. hand. I wanted to see if he I just wondered if any other entities of the city of Longmont are uh, contemplating something similar. And uh, if they are, uh, should we, we, we be working in concert with them as, a, as an option? The kind of the way that this has happened is that, you know, the museum started looking into it as a result of the Longmont 150 um, exhibition. And then I was in a meeting with Carmen Ramirez, who is the director of the um, neighborhood and uh, neighborhood resources. And she was like, oh, well, we should be doing this too. So it has kind of started to spark a bunch of different people. Sustainability is now talking about it. Um, and so I, this really, I think, because we already had started working on this, I think the museum is well positioned to kind of be a, a leader. Um, okay. and, and I'm hoping to get, um, you know, Susie to help us kind of take this up to the level of city council um, so that we can do exactly what you're talking about, Tom, to be able to have this be a kind of citywide endeavor. Okay, that's I'm uh, just curious. Yeah. Thank you. Lots of people have been talking about it lately, and and because we had already started working on it, we sure. kind of we we kind of became the default leaders, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kim, at this point, is there anything really that? There isn't really anything that this board can do specifically, like particularly in this meeting. Um, um, I mean, what I what I am hoping is that you know we we have the support of the advisory board um, to to pursue this. Um, Eric has drafted um, a, a statement. Um, and it's really just a draft at this point um, based on the work that Montoya had done, which really, as you might have seen in those documents, um, ended with, you know, you really need an action item in there, um, mm -hmm. that, it, that it's not just a, a recognition, but there's actually an action item in there. Um, and then Susie, if you don't mind, I would I would love your feedback because um, we exchanged an email earlier. It sounds like you've worked on these things before yourself. Yes, yes, I have. And so um, for the last uh, three or four years, the National Education Association has adopted the use of land acknowledgements prior to any presentation that we um, that we offer for our members, um, other um, teachers and trainings. And um, and so I had shared some examples with Kim. Um, it can range from anything from a video We've done um, things where it's uh, just part of a slideshow right before our presentation, um, something listed on a website. Um, really what in the areas of our presentation. So I had worked, I was a part of an educator's um, kind of Zoom um, book study. And we, we did, um, and it was from the um, book. We started it with um, from the book Stamped, which is by the same author who wrote um, the how to be an anti-racist 
So it was the same. And so it was a variation of that, um, just another, another book title. And I had worked with educators from New York, here in Colorado and California. And so we, when we did our land acknowledgement, we actually pulled from recognizing the, the tribes and the, um, the ancestry that was on these lands in these different areas. So we just, you know, it's almost like I, I kind of attribute it because, you know, I'm, I'm Catholic. So, you know, before we have any kind of um, meal or anything, you know, we kind of, you know, have a moment of, of silence, a moment of grace and thankful. So it, I, for me, you know, as I was kind of explaining it to people who had nothing, who knew nothing about what this was, I was like, well, I kind of almost like think of it as, as like a prayer prior to it's that acknowledgement and appreciation and respect for the people that have been on these lands prior to us and just offering that, that bit of um, respect and um, acknowledgement to, and, and recognition of the histories that were here prior to us. Um, so, you know, there's varying ways that we can, um, we can go about, you know, it could be something that's presented on a website. It could be something that is done prior to, um, a meeting or, you know, you know, we're doing a lot of virtual programming. It could be something that that's shared and displayed before a particular program. And, um, and it's really fascinating too, to know, especially when I was working with colleagues from different, um, parts of the United States what tribal, um, what tribes had been there in those areas prior to, um, you know, being New York or prior to, you know, being San Diego. And um, so it was, it was, it's interesting. It's, I think, you know, it, it's very much in line with what the museum's doing as far as education and, and historical context. So I, I, I think having the museum lead this is, is wonderful. I think, you know, it's very appropriate. And um, so I think for me as a person on city council, you know, I could say, well, you know, the, this is something that the museum, the board of museum is prioritizing. We wanted to see this move forward. So, so just to have, I guess, the consent of the, the board, I think it would mean um, it would be more powerful as I, as I bring this up. So it's like, oh God, it's not Susie again, just bring in another thing. <laughs> But it's really something that's um, driven by the community. So that's, yeah. So in that vein, Susie, do you think that, um, uh, how, how would you feel most comfortable? Should we draft something for you to take to the rest of the council? Or do you wanna just introduce the, the concept of it with our, you know, with the, with the advisory board's blessing what, what do you think is the next step? So um, so I think when I um, made the statement, when I um, back with the George Floyd, so yeah. I had written that statement. I sat down, I, you know, I talked to Harold, I spoke with Marika and she kind of helped. Um, so, you know, I brought, brought, brought forward, you know, the essential, like the skeleton part of it. And Marika really went in and, and cleaned it up for me. And I'm, so if I had something that was, you know, this land acknowledgement would be included here and, and just kind of have like a skeletal of what needs to be included in these to make them authentic. Um, I think, you know, we could have city staff um, help us revise and, but, you know, if, there, if you have ideas of what you think, what we think really needs to be in, included on there and then um, staff can kind of help rewrite and and revise that, polish it up. So, but if I have something just to make my case. To respond to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. So Eric, do you wanna share, do you think you wanna, this is a time to share the draft that you put together? Sure, sure. I can just uh, share my screen so people can, can see that. So again, very rough first draft, just basically trying to get the, the bones of it, of it out there, but um, you know, saying we acknowledge that Longmont sits on the traditional territory of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute peoples. We honor the history and the connection that they have with this land. It is our commitment to 
face the injustice that has happened when this land was taken and to educate our children that, to ensure that it does not happen again. Wow. Um, so a couple of the things this identifies the traditional tribes. There are other tribes certainly that, that were in this area. Uh, I think the city of Denver actually acknowledges 48 tribes within Colorado in their land acknowledgement statement. But these are the three that that uh, have, have had really the strongest connection, I think, uh, to, to the area. So that's, that's kind of why, why I chose those three. Um, and then wanting to do a call to action, wanting it not just to be a, a uh, we acknowledge this and go forth, but, but really have, have something that then we can, we can commit to doing. So that was, that was kind of the last, uh, last sentence as well. But again, really at this point, you're the first people to have seen it. So um, it, it's uh, very much a work in progress that would love to have your thoughts on what does this include? What does this miss? What, what should we be doing? So do we want to take, um, take this back with us and then come back to the meeting next month with, with ideas or we could forward ideas to Eric between now and then and then maybe at that point or the next meeting we have something to send with Susie. I don't know how quickly we want to move this through, Kim. Well, so um, I, I don't want to rush anything because I think that we need to make sure that we do it right. But I will throw it out there as a, a milestone that we may take into consideration, which is that in May sometime, the um, sister city relationship with the Northern Arapaho is supposed to be solidified. And so ideally, ideally, we have the statement ready for the ceremony that will take part with that, um, re you know, the recognition of the sister city relationship. So, so I, like I said, I don't want to rush anything because I want to do it right. But, um, but if we were going to aim for a target, that is probably the one to aim for. <laughs> So if we if if we were able to bring it back in April, well, you know, this time next month, does that Susie give you time to do anything before May? Um, I think so. You okay. know, and and so we don't we don't meet as a council next week, and then okay. the following week, I believe I don't think it's a regular session. Although I don't, I don't think it matters. I can bring forward things during a study session, but um, so no, I you know I think I know with the George Floyd um, statement, it, the turnaround was was really quick. It was okay. yeah, it was within. So I had brought it forward on council, and then we actually all signed it by Wednesday and brought it like it. We oh, expedited wow. that because we were getting a lot of. Um, I think the city was getting a lot of public pressure from various groups. And so they wanted to, to expedite that. But I think in May, what um, that should give us plenty of time. Okay. And, Angela, uh, did you have something that you wanted to add? I actually did speak with Carmen Ramirez just yesterday. Oh, yeah. Sister Cities, Northern Arapaho, because the Northern Arapaho have been struggling with their COVID uh, situation within the tribe. Actually, it's quite extensive. And so the May date has been pushed to September. So mm -hmm. that actually may assist in this. And that's very, and that is quite literally uh, just changed very recently. So hot, hot off the presses. Okay, well, hot I'm glad you were here. <laughs> Well, so that gives us some, some wiggle of time. Room. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. That gives us some wiggle room. Okay. And then, so, so, it does, I, I, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think then the next um, milestone is probably the opening of the exhibit, which is in August. Yeah. That'll be August 6th. Yeah. So, yeah. That would be great because we'd love to have it on the wall of the museum for that opening. Yeah. So what if we, um, unless we want to do it faster than that, what if we plan to have more an in-depth discussion of this and, and with people's input next month? 
and then we, we can, um, whatever we kind of come up with, then we could forward on to Susie to um, take to the council. Does that seem reasonable to everybody? We can sure. make, this, make this a focus next month. Sounds great. So everybody can think about it. Yeah. Tom, I have a uh, Eric, are you going to send that statement out to us? Yeah, I'll, I'll so, email it out to the whole board. Yeah, I've been trying to copy it or print <laughs> it, but it won't do it. <laughs> yeah. I also uh -huh. have some examples that I sent to Kim. If you, if anybody wants to see those as well, I can forward you that email. Great. Of different land acknowledgments. Great. Great. I can, I can forward you. your email to um, that. I, might, I probably have everybody's email addresses. Oh, so that's maybe. true. Yeah, no, yeah. that would be great. Okay, yeah. okay. I'll be, send that out. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Kim. So then we'll plan on being prepared next month to um, work on this in more uh, detail. Anybody else have any other comments about this particular topic before we move on? Okay, great. I, I just, I, I do have one thing to add. I don't exactly know the relevance of it, but just um, to note that in Denver, the Denver City Council um, adopted a statement and um, that came directly from a council member. Um, and so the, I think the actual statement came from that council member. Um, and so the way that they do it is they do, but before every single council meeting, they actually recite the, the acknowledge it. So I think that that's probably one of the things that we should discuss is, you know, kind of where this will show up and, you know, who, anyway, kind of, kind of how it's used, if you will. So that sure. I think should be part of our conversation. And sometimes briefer would be better if we do read it. Yeah, there are some very long. Not briefer than what Eric said, but I mean, <laughs> something along those lines. Great, I agree. Okay, well, we'll get that on the agenda for next um, month. And then one other piece of old business I just wanted to mention. Um, we had talked about the uh, addendum that we were going to add in some form to the bylaws um, to reflect the fact that we're um, doing this emergency kind of meeting virtually. Uh, so we um, are still finalizing how that's going to look. So that will come up next month also. And in addition, um, I assume you all have copies of the bylaws, but I'm going to ask Joanne to make sure everybody has a copy because I thought this would be our opportunity to review the bylaws that we have in case there's anything else in there that anybody notices that looks odd or needs to be um, perhaps um, changed or I don't know, something to be talked about. So just so you know, um, she'll be sending that to you. So we will look at that um, a little bit as well uh, next month. So um, that is all that I have. Does anybody have other new business or comments? Okay, well, great. Well, thank you all and um, look forward to um, working on some of these things next month. And uh, thank you, Angela, for facilitating and um, Eric, thank you so much for making a start on the land acknowledgement statement. It's one of those seems like it's kind of hard to figure out exactly where to start. So thank you all. And, I have a motion to adjourn. Oh, yeah, sorry. Is there a motion to adjourn, Tom? I move to adjourn. I move. Okay, we have Tom and Chris all in favor of adjourning. Opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Many Thank thanks you. to all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Have a good Thank evening. You. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Sorry, Joanne, I forgot. Oh, sorry, I chirped in. <laughs> oh, no, no, no problem. It.
So 535 <laughs> is what I get. 35, got it. So Angela, so you're the great, you're the saver of this recording. Oh, am I? <laughs> well, uh -oh, okay, technical so time. I'll be, okay. so I can be saver. So let me just, I need some moral support here. <laughs> you guys so don't I need me though, do you? No, we don't. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you very much, Eve. Bye. Welcome. See you tomorrow. Nice to see bye. you. Bye. Nice to see you. Appreciate it. Bye. I, you have good taste in chocolate. Oh, good. I'm glad you liked Thank it. You. <laughs> well, it's just very uncomfortable when you receive a gift from someone and then you're like, I like saying thanks in person and I have a thank you note. Where do I put it? Anyways, so. I know. It's hard. I'm sorry. But it was. Oh, don't worry. Thank My you. My hair got frizzier throughout this entire thing. Well, anyways. Oh, mine got flatter. So, see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll see you. Bye bye. Bye, ladies. Bye. So, I understand that this recording saves to the SAM account. And in fact, we have to go and grab it and move it. Um, but that was not a part of our formal training that both you and I attended. So I'm going, I have the stop recording button. I can just push it and then put okay. it on drives. If I, if it like pops up, hey, you have a file and then I'll send you a link to where it goes. Most groovy, okay. So yeah, okay, so you'll save it and- I'm gonna stop it right now. Ready? Let's see what happens.